Hey there, API enthusiasts, and welcome back to another video. Today, I'm going to take you into an open API specification and show at a high level what it does and its various components. But first, let's start with the basics and briefly talk about what an HTTP REST API is and how an open API specification fits into that. Feel free to skip ahead to the next section if this is already familiar to you. An HTTP REST API is an architectural style and protocol for building web services. REST itself is a set of constraints and principles that define how your API endpoints are structured so that they stay isolated and stateless. In more simple terms, this means that every request to a REST API service is independent of any other request. REST is commonly paired with the HTTP protocol and standard HTTP methods like GET, POST, and DELETE by making requests to resources identified by URLs. For example, in a Nest.js application, your controllers and services that handle requests to endpoints like slash users or slash products, that's your REST API implementation. It's the actual running code that clients interact with. OpenAPI, on the other hand, is a specification format for describing HTTP APIs. It's a standardized way to document your API's endpoints, request and response formats, authentication methods, and more in a machine-readable format. You might also sometimes see the name Swagger. Swagger was the original name for OpenAPI specifications through version 2.0. From version 3.0 onwards, the specifications are now called OpenAPI. This is why you'll often see references to Swagger 2.0 and OpenAPI 3.0 or 3.1. It was essentially a name change plus the formation of a new organization. Today, Swagger is used to refer to specific tools like Swagger Editor, but that's beyond the scope of this video. But now let's take a first-hand look at an open API specification. These files come in either JSON or YAML format. Either format can be used. It all boils down to personal preference. For this example, we'll be using Poke API spec. Poke API is a free API service that lets anyone look up Pokemon stats and information. I've collapsed the file to make it a bit easier to digest, but we'll be looking at a bunch of different sections. First, at the top, we have Open API, and this just declares the version number of the spec. So here we're looking at the latest version, a 3.1.0 specification. Next is info, then pads, components, servers, tags, and external docs. These are all the primary sections that you'll find in any typical Open API specification. Now, let's look at info. If we expand it, we'll see a few additional fields. First, we'll see title, which is Poke API, then version 2.7.0. This is actually the version of the API itself. And then description that basically describes what it is the Poke API does. These bits of information are super, super important. Oftentimes when you're auto-generating documentation or other things, you're, this is the very first piece of data that your users are going to see. Next is the pads section, which describes every endpoint available in the Poke API. So if we go ahead and open up our pads, and I'll just make that a little smaller for you, collapse everything down. What we can first see here are a variety of different endpoints that are pads that the Poke API will respond to and provide data for. If we go ahead and expand one of them, we'll see a variety of HTTP methods that each endpoint supports. In this case, the berry slash ID endpoint here supports the get HTTP method. It then has an operation ID, which is used to distinguish this method from all others. It provides a human readable description. This will obviously work into your documentation and also SDK generators if you use them, such as LibLab. Uh, it gives a short summary, which is very similar to a description, but just a shorter explanation. And then it defines the parameters that this endpoint will actually accept and where they are. So for example, and when this isn't going to be an exhaustive example, but here we can see that we have a parameter and it's in the path and its name is ID. That's referring to the ID up here. And it's saying that it is in the path as opposed to being somewhere else. There will also be a schema and it will tell you, oh, that ID in that path is of type string. And then a description of exactly what this item is and what it can be. Again, this isn't exhaustive, it's just a general overview of the variety of arguments that can be provided to parameters and an overall description of how each of these requests are structured. There's also tags, which we're actually going to see a bit later. 
and some references to the security or authentication that this endpoint supports. And lastly, what you'll see defined are a series of responses. Uh, these are typically represented as HTTP status codes. You'll also get a content type and a schema that refers to the actual structure of the response that you'll get back. But those are often placed into components that reference elsewhere within the open API file. And now let's go actually check out one of those references. So if I go ahead and click here, we're going to be placed into our components section of the open API spec. And down here, we'll see the very detail defined. And this is a schema for the response that's going to come back to the user. What you'll see here are the types. These are can be objects, they can be arrays, they can be Boolean, strings, a whole bunch of other values. And properties. These are essentially the components of the object that are going to come back, what their types are, whether you can read them, what their lengths are, and a variety of other different restrictions and definitions that, again, would be beyond the scope of this video. But just to give you an overview, this is how it will look like. This can look like a lot, but it's important to keep in mind that you typically won't be writing all this. Normally, when it comes to any HTTP API you can write out there, you'll be writing it within a framework. And those frameworks typically have a simple and easy way to produce open API specs from them. You can actually go ahead and check some of the links down below because down there we have some framework guides for doing exactly that. But the parts that you will be writing include things such as descriptions, examples, or other data that isn't able to be automatically derived by your framework. And now let's check out the server section. So we'll go ahead and navigate to the top of our file. We'll collapse everything back down and expand servers. One of the smallest sections we're going to see in an open API spec. Typically, it's just a few URLs basically saying where the service exists on, out on the internet. In this case, it's at pokeapi.co. And then let's take a look at tags. We'll expand it. We'll minimize things a bit for you. And here we are. Here we have a variety of different tags that are essentially human readable descriptions and groupings for the other components within the open API spec. So for example, here, if we expand berries, we'll see a description of berries and we'll find even where we can find more information from some external documentation. And then if we go looking for the berries tag within our API spec here, or rather within Pokemon API spec here, we'll see there are a variety of endpoints related to berries that get tagged as berries. And that's just a great way to organize your open API spec and also additional tooling can actually use those tags to make better sense of them and provide a better sense of organization and navigation throughout your project. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this, but just so you know. And lastly, we have external docs. Those essentially just point to URLs where additional documentation can be found. In this case, an external documentation representation of the Pokemon API is here at pokeapi.co slash doc slash v2. And I can almost guarantee you here that these docs here that are on the Pokemon API website were actually generated from this spec here. And that really boils down to the power of an open API spec is that you can define all of this once, you can get a whole ton of this information already from your framework. You just need to fill out a little bit about descriptions and what your API does and how it works. And then you're great for generating docs, you're great for generating SDKs with tools such as LibLab, and you greatly reduce your maintenance burden while also greatly increasing the reliability of your API. And that's a relatively quick overview of what you can typically find in an open API specification. This awesome machine readable standard enables amazing tooling like automatic documentation, testing tools, mocking tools, and automatic client SDK generation using tools such as LibLab. So to wrap up, remember that REST and HTTP describe your actual API. That's the code that runs on your server. While OpenAPI is a specification for documenting and describing that API. I strongly recommend implementing a REST API following best practices, documenting it with OpenAPI 3.1. And if you do so, you can then use tools like LiveLab to generate client SDKs automatically. More about that though in the links down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to get more videos on REST APIs, open API specifications, and SDK generation. Thanks again for watching and have a great day.